I recently came across this quote from legendary filmmaker Billy Wilder where he said basically, don't give your audience the answers. Give them two plus two and let them find the solutions for themselves and they'll love you for it. Now in my 20 years of filmmaking, I found this to be a bedrock of good storytelling both in my own films and in the films that I love to watch too. So in this video, I'm gonna break down some examples that illustrate this technique in action both when it's done right and when it's done wrong. And I'm also gonna explain why this is such a powerful technique for any audience. Now, if you're new to this channel, I'm Kent Lamb. This is Standard Story Company. I've been making films since I was 11, so 20 years now. Made a viral, no budget feature film, a viral short film. Find them on this channel. But today, we're gonna be talking about this two plus two idea from Billy Wilder. So, two plus two, what does that look like? I just watched the film Minari for the first time with my girlfriend, and after the credits rolled, we were both struck by how much we figured out about the story after we finished watching the film. Many moments you kind of had to piece together for yourself, and it was actually a very efficient and effective way to tell the story. Now, I'm not gonna spoil anything if you haven't seen the film. Just a couple of quick examples from Minari. When the wife is at home and she's practicing sexing the chickens, from an earlier scene where we found out that she had gotten fired from her job at California. Now she's doing it in Arkansas where the standards aren't as high and she can get by. But when we see her practicing at home, we can now take two plus two and realize she still is planning on going back to California. She wants to get faster. She wants to be able to support herself if she needs to because she doesn't really believe in her husband's farm. Another more powerful example of that in Minari is the character of the farmhand. He's this minor character, really eccentric, and all we learn about his backstory really is that he was in the Korean War. And in the first scene with him and Mr. Yi, he says, it was a hard time, I'm sure you know. That's all we know about his experience in the Korean War. But we can take the clues that the director and writer left for us and piece together some of his backstory. For me, it was like, oh, he was in the Korean War, it was a hard time. He's very eager to work for Mr. Yi and to be friends with the Yi family. And then later in the film, we see him literally carrying a cross. So we know he has uh, some burdens. He was probably traumatized in the war. He probably turned to Christianity afterwards to try to, you know, make up for the atrocities he might have seen or committed there. And he probably sees the Yi family as a means of salvation for himself. I created an entire backstory for this character that I know almost nothing about. And that's the definition of good storytelling. The filmmaker didn't have time to go through this minor character's entire backstory and feed it all to the audience, but he gave just a couple of clues that let me piece something together for myself that provided me with so much empathy and understanding for this super minor, very eccentric out there character. So effectively, you are making your audience a collaborator in your storytelling when you employ this technique. And I think it's especially effective in horror films because if you think about it, a lot of the best horror films don't wrap everything up in a nice bow, they don't explain anything, and when you're left to fill in those gaps, you're gonna fill in the gaps with the things that are the most terrifying to you personally. So when I see a film like The Shining, where there's a lot of mystery in that film, a lot of things that just are not explained, and the audience is forced to fill in those gaps for themselves, and they're gonna be filling them in with the most terrifying things they can think of. So if you're a writer, you're never gonna be able to top that and write something scarier than that for each individual member of your audience. But it's a very delicate balance, and it's easy to kind of mess up this two plus two technique. And I'm gonna show you three quick examples from my own films. Once where I hit the mark just about right, once where I went too far and I over-explained and made the clues way too obvious, and once where I was actually too vague and the technique didn't work because I didn't set the audience up for success in solving the questions that I was giving them. Hopefully these examples from my own films will help you catch these mistakes in your own projects. All right, so a time when I over-explained. If we go to an old short film of mine called A Wake, this thing was riddled with cringeworthy exposition and just bad filmmaking, bad storytelling all around. But one of the biggest mistakes I made was I just told the audience what this character's motivation is, what he's feeling by having him write in a journal what's going on. This is just blatant exposition. So this is the opposite of what Billy Wilder is advising us to do. I'm not giving the audience any room to figure out for themselves what this character wants, what he's going through. I'm just telling you. But before I can see you, I have to know the truth. <clears throat> Gross, disgusting, right? I hate it. And then I submitted this thing to Sundance and couldn't believe that it didn't get in, wow. Who'd have thunk it? Now let's take an example where this two plus two technique I think did work and it was an example of subtle 
storytelling. My $6,000 feature film, Bad is Bad. Now, if you haven't seen the film, all you need to know is there are two bad guys in the film who are kind of the main characters, Jesse, Ray. And we know that Jesse does not trust Ray around girls. We know that because of this scene. Ray, what? It's not, I, I can't, I'm, I'm not gonna do this again. What are you talking about? I'm talking about Sarah. Jesse, shut up. I don't. Do you remember uh, Sarah? Do you remember what happened with Sarah? Shut up. Seriously. Do you remember? Yeah. All right, good. I can't do that again for you. Yeah. Stop looking at the girls. All right, all right, fine. You caught me. Later in the film, Jesse has to leave Ray alone, and of course, after he does that, a young girl enters the picture. We see them interacting and we see that it's going to a dark place, but then the girl makes a break for it and tries to escape, but we cut away. Jesse comes home, Jesse asks what happened, Ray tells his version of what happened, Jesse buys it, and after Jesse walks away, we get the second part of the math equation with this little sound effect. Sounds like he zipped up his pants. I think that was just enough for the audience to figure out that Ray maybe was not telling the full truth to his friend and that something very bad may have happened in that house while he was gone. All right, and then lastly, a time when this two plus two technique did not work because I was actually too vague with the clues. If we go back to a short film I made called The Big Idea, so there was this great little twist ending at the end of this short film. Even though this character got killed, he had a tape recorder on him where he recorded the killer admitting his guilt before he killed him, so justice would be served. And that was the nice little satisfying twist at the end of the movie. But then we thought, let's do the little two plus two, and we've already set this character up as a, a loser who has good ideas, but isn't good at executing those ideas, and that's his problem. So what if he brings the recorder, but he forgets to put a tape inside the recorder, and his last ditch effort at getting justice is ruined because again, he failed to execute his idea. We thought that was gonna be a great way for the audience to piece together what happened to him at the end, but it did not work. So we actually saw this play at a film festival with an audience in a theater, and what happened was at the end, when the cop pulls out the tape recorder, there was an audible gasp from the audience, and I was like, yes, got him. Wait till they see what comes up next. And then five seconds later, the cop opens up the tape recorder, and there's no tape inside, and instead of everybody going, oh, I heard, what? And then a bunch of like mumbling and whispering to each other. No, not good. Now it made perfect sense in our heads why the tape wouldn't be in there. And I figured that we had set this character up in such a way that the audience would realize, oh my God, he's such a idiot that he forgot to put the tape in the tape recorder. But I was wrong. That ending created a bunch of questions that the audience could not find a clear answer to because I had just given them too vague of a clue of who this guy actually was. They were wondering, why would he bring a tape recorder with no tape in it? Did the other guy steal the tape? Also, just from a storytelling point of view, a double twist like that can work, but you can't just have five or 10 seconds between the two twists. It's not enough time to process and really appreciate either one of them. In the advertising world, we'd call that putting a hat on a hat. In other words, you're sacrificing this nice moment that you came up with originally for another moment that you wanna add on top of it, even though it just kind of on that original nice moment. If you wanna see another example where I messed up this technique, check out this video on screenwriting mistakes and skip to the part where I talk about Will the Machine and the dialogue in the coach scene. I over explained it, had to fix it in post. I'm gonna be making more videos, breaking down advice from legends in filmmaking, so definitely subscribe for more, give me a thumbs up, and I will see you next week.